All right, hello everybody and welcome to what's going to be another verdict. Um, today we're going to talk about Final Fantasy 16, which is a game that I just finished. Um, there's a lot to say about it. It's mostly about the gameplay because it's a very gameplay-centric game. Um, and uh, yeah, let's hop right into it. So for starters, Final Fantasy 16 is an RPG. It's part of the Final Fantasy genre, or genre, the Final Fantasy series, um, which are generally RPGs for the most part. Unlike... A lot of the earlier games, and more similarly, I guess, to 15, Final Fantasy 16 is a much more action-oriented version of Final Fantasy gameplay. So, whereas 15 was real-time, you know, you could issue some commands to your teammates, or however that was, it's been a while, um, and you could generally, you know, attack in real-time, dodge in real-time, move in real-time, versus you know the usual final fantasy where it's four dudes in a row and you're charging bars or you're just going you know based off your speed final fantasy 16 plays much more closely to an action game like devil may cry or bayonetta which is by design of course where you have to dodge there's stricter timing on your dodge than there ever was in 15 combos and all sorts of other things play in play a factor and how quickly you know you could charge your limit break you know how much you could stun lock enemies and like i said this game has more of an emphasis on fast-paced action gameplay versus uh you know turn-based or active time battle or i'm not even sure what they used to call 12 where you, you know it's kind of a mix which is i mean people like 12 so it, you know it's crazy because people didn't like 12 when it first came out now they like 12 it's a whole mess anyway the basis of this game is that you play as clive rosfield who is a swordsman he's a he's the his, he's the protector of his brother who is the heir to the ducal throne in the duchess of rosaria and throughout the game you travel through Clive's life, you know, there's three different distinct time periods. There's the first time period, which is when he's a kid, which plays more like a tutorial. It's more like an intro to the character. There's the second time period where he's older. He's like 23. He's just trying to, you know, survive, do his thing. And then lastly, um, I'm sorry, not 23, 28. And then lastly, there's five years after that, which is where the majority of the game takes place, which is when he's 33, he's, you know, blazing through stuff. Um, and Clive's main goal is to free humanity from the blight of the Mother Crystals. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but basically, humanity in this universe worships these things called Mother Crystals, which are gigantic crystalline structures that dot the land. Entire civilizations are based around them. So, for example, you know, this game world, it's more like, um, you, know, you know, you have the Duchess of Rosaria, you have um, the Holy Empire of San Breck, you have the Republic of Dalmechia, there's all sorts of factions, the Kingdom of Elude, that all worship different Mother Crystals. And Clive's main goal is to destroy all of them. Now, how he goes about it, how he gets to it, not going to get too in-depth into it. Um, I'll come back to the story in a little bit because I, I think the gameplay is more to talk about. I actually like the, the, the brief aside is I like the story. I think it flows well. I think the biggest issues with this game stem almost wholly from its gameplay and how it's set up. So as I said before, you know, it's, it's meant to be an action-based game. Things happen in real time. Enemies attack you in real time. Um, you have your basic combat where you can swing Clive's sword. You can jump during combat, which is used sometimes to cancel abilities or allow you to footstool off enemies or other things. You have the ability to fire magic. And um, you also have, and this is, you know, the big selling point of the game, what's called icons. Now, if you're familiar with Final Fantasy XIV, you know what an icon is. It's basically similarly, uh, it, it functions similar to the summon system of other Final Fantasy games. You, you can, at any point in battle, have up to three icons at your beck and call. And each one, when you press circle, will do a different action. So, for example, if you have Phoenix, you can teleport a short distance forward towards your target. If you have Titan, you can summon big rock hands to deflect your enemy's attacks. You know, and there's all sorts of other ones along the way that you could use. Um, now, your ability to gain these is tied entirely to the story. And that's one thing that I think is cool, but at the same time, I always thought that Final Fantasy games, when they had summons, it was cool when you had to go out of your way to get a couple of them. That's more like Final Fantasy IV. I think Final Fantasy X did this a little bit as well. 
it's tied to the story so you can only get them in one order um and, and you, it really takes you a while to get a lot of them to be honest with you you're, you're going to be spending most of the game pretty much stuck with the same two or three icons that you get in the first half and then the, the back end is like the remaining like five or so um but beyond that uh you can use these abilities as clyde progresses through the game and you know finds and defeats the people that are carrying them usually there's other ways he gets them and each one each icon also comes with three different moves and an ultimate move so for example garuda comes with uh rook's gambit which is like a counter move that you could use with really strict timing it, it, it does more damage when you counter it's a back dodge into an attack and if you successfully dodge an attack with it you do more damage um on top of that garuda also has goge which is just a, a multi-hit attack and um what was the last one wicked wheel which is you know the classic if you play 14 uh which is just a aoe around there so with these three moves and then lastly garuda's classic aerial blast you know each one each different icon has up to five different abilities that you can equip now by default one of those abilities is the icons like de facto ability so like for example with garuda you could summon a claw to grab someone from afar or if they're too heavy jump you know it makes clive automatically jump and attack with it um so every icon has four active abilities that you can set and one mandatory ability that's always set whenever you select that icon and as i said clive can have up to three icons um you could toggle between them pretty quickly um, you can only toggle between them in one direction, which is ironic because I actually said that, you know, I'm playing Pikmin 4 now. I kind of wish you could, you had a button. Well, you know, they, they kind of do the opposite where you could toggle between Pikmin in, in, in any direction, which is funny because you can only have three Pikmin types. But in this one, you can only toggle forward through your icon list. Now, you can have less than two, three icons. You can have, uh, you can change the order of the icons, right? Um... They let you play around with that. Personally, uh, I like. I think that the icon system's cool. I think it might have been better if you could have had four icons, and maybe if it was assigned to the D-pad. I know that they they push. They made it one button push, which is probably like you don't want to have too many because then it takes too long to cycle back to the original if you need it. So they they kept it at three. It's it, it's a functional system. I don't think it's an amazing system, but it works, and you can get through things. Most combat you know scenarios just fine. Now, whenever you use an icon ability, unlike attack and unlike shoot magic, um, you will automatically enter, you know, recharge. It has a cooldown before you could use it again. And the same, it's, it's your basic cooldown, so there's not really much to explain about it. You can shorten it by having items. Um, as you fight, it will automatically recharge, things like that. Um, going back to your attack and your magic, you could hold your magic button in order to charge a higher level version of that spell. So for example, <clears throat> you could hold fire to cast Fyra, you could hold thunder to cast Thundara, etc., etc. There's There's no upgrade to this where that lets you get to the Ga level spells, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, I kind of think that would be interesting, that would be cool. Um, and ba because, you know, it's the usual Final Fantasy thing now where nothing is immune, right? You know, the whole immunity resistance is based on the way the magic system's set up. It doesn't really matter what kind of magic you use. It's just more like tied to the icon itself. So like if, you know, what's a common weakness, I guess? Like if you fight a zombie, I don't even know if there are zombies. I forget in this game. But like usually in Final Fantasy, zombies are weak to fire, right? Fire and holy. Um, because of the way the game is set up, fire does not deal any extra damage in particular versus if you were to just use thunder it's just purely cosmetic uh again i know why they did this right the whole thing is swapping between icons if they didn't do this then you'd have to um you know if, if they had enemy weaknesses like an old fire uh, fire like an old final fantasy game then you would have to swap stuff around you know what i mean and it, it could be you know messy you could enter a fight you know they'd have to let you basically access whatever uh creature or whatever icon you need all the time because otherwise you could just be locked if you don't have anything effective um magic is helpful it can be used to stun enemies especially if you charge it uh on the other hand with clive's sword you can hold this is an upgrade that you could buy for really cheap 
um, you can hold the sword button and it'll charge his sword with fire and you can use that just to stagger enemies, deal damage and a little bit of knockback, especially if you upgrade it. Um, as I said, you can upgrade abilities. You can purchase them from the ability menu. Very straightforward. The more, you, more quests you do, the more fighting you do, etc. The more ability Clive has, you know, he gets AP. Like any other Final Fantasy game, you spend AP to unlock abilities and upgrade the ones you have. Very straightforward. You've seen this in a hundred games. There's nothing complex or different about that. No need to exp over explain it. Um, so yeah, beyond that, obviously the whole goal is to combo moves. Each different icon move is has a different uh, effect. So some are just single target moves, some are AOEs. Like I said, the ultimate moves like Aerial Blast and Judgment Bolt, uh, you know, vary in their usage. Some are AOE, some are single target. Um, you can equip as many of these as you want, uh, up to six different, well, I guess up to six, right? Uh, if you upgrade a move fully, you can use it on any icon. So for example, if you want to use Judgment Bolt, you either have to have Ramu equipped or what you can do as the game progresses, you get more AP and it's very expensive to do this. Uh, but was ultimately my strategy was to upgrade moves fully so that way I could use ultimate moves on other icons. And needless to say, very helpful, right? It's beautiful. It's a great thing to do. I really enjoy it. Um, and that way you can get big damage. You know, once I start doing that, the damage numbers start shooting to the moon, which is always a fun thing to see. Uh, lastly, during combat, well, I guess not lastly, but during combat, Clive is also assisted by Torgal who is his, uh, his dog that can help him in combat. So for example, you can command Torgal to do things like attack enemies, uh, heal you. It's not really a great heal. It's, it's been memed on. It's like a really low regen. Uh, and then finally Ravage, which is like an extra combo like launcher. So like you could command Torgal basically to attack enemies or to launch them. Um, he's pretty helpful even if you don't command him. The heal button will pretty much never be used. And in order to do this, you have to toggle off healing. For the most part, I just never really use Torgal. And to be fair with you, I pretty much completed every aspect of the game without really commanding him. So <clears throat> I think it's a little bit... It's like one of those systems that's there and it's not bad, but it doesn't really add much. It doesn't change much if you don't engage with it. So if, you, if you're down with that, if you're cool with that, then, then you know you could use that system it works but personally i didn't really gain anything from it i didn't really think it added too much to the game so i don't hate it but at the same time i also am not like a blown away by it um torgal of course is in the story he has other things he's actually one of the few party members that you keep around almost all the time now in this game they do the thing that you know a couple other games did you might remember i think 13 had this 12 had this uh Final Fantasy 2 hilariously has this, but you can fully command them. Um, you have party members that come and go based on, you know, story events and whatnot. So depending on where you are in the story, you might have actual other characters assist you in combat, you know, running around, hitting enemies, etc., etc. Now, you can't control them, but they do a good job of basically taking one enemy and then just fighting away from you, you know, for the most part, which is cool if you're fighting like five enemies, you have two party members, you know, they take one enemy away, you're only fighting three enemies, which might sound like a lot. Again, this is an action game. It's not like impossible, you know, it's not like a Dark Souls game or anything, um, which is cool. They're actually able to fight enemies. You know, most games, your, your AI teammates just either are too good or too shit. And in this game, clearly they are very good at what they do. Now, they'll even kill enemies by themselves given enough time, which is usually pretty rare. A lot of times in these games, you know, these AI are not killing anything. So, yeah. Um, beyond that, you know, it's the standard fare for equipment, right? You get better swords, you can craft them. Now, this game has a, a crafting system. You could buy swords as well, but for the most part, you pretty much only need to craft, especially if you're doing hunts and side quests and stuff. If you do every side quest and every hunt in the game, you could craft the best armor, no problem. Again, it's not as complex as a game like Final Fantasy XII or even Kingdom Hearts. If you know some of the end game crafts in Kingdom Hearts can take several minutes to an hour to get some of the materials to drop so you could craft. But, um, you know, again, this game, I think that they really wanted to make sure that no one was off put 
by stuff like that. If you remember, you know, that was more of a 2000s era thing where games would have these ridiculous crafting systems that you would need to like grind materials for. At no point during the game when I did all the side quests and everything, did I ever feel like I needed to grind, which could be good, but also, you know what I mean? Like that, that could be a good thing. Normally that's a good thing. You don't have to go out and just do whatever for a couple hours, you know? Um, but at the same time, it also meant that there was never a point where I hit a hurdle that I couldn't overcome by either drinking potions or just mashing harder. And I think that, like, obviously, it's not meant to be difficult. Again, this game, they intentionally wanted to make it so, like, there wasn't really a difficulty slider. Uh, you determine how difficult the game is because the game gives you five unique charms. Uh, that can be used and equipped by Clive at any point. I think it's up to three uh, Three charms can be equipped by Clive. So, like, there's one that lets you auto-dodge, and I don't even know what they do because I didn't equip them because I'm not a pussy and I'm not a game journalist. But you could, you could use them to auto-play the game and stuff like that. It's similar to uh, the ring from Final Fantasy XV that lets you pretty much dodge attacks, except it's automatic. You don't even have to press a button for it. Now, granted, I do think the magic system in this game is better than Final Fantasy XV's, but Final Fantasy XV's, like, grenade magic system at least had, like, elemental weaknesses. Now, granted, the change that they've made to Final Fantasy since the, you know, the olden days is that pretty much everything is weak to magic, so that way any player who picks it up and just mashes, you know, they don't care. I guess they're assuming that the people that are going to play this don't care to learn elemental weaknesses and resistances so all that they want to learn excuse me for picking this up is mash 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 mash, mash. and that's all they want to do right they just want to constantly hit 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 and you know they they at least let you beat the game doing that and dodging with some amount of proper timing now i don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing but i also realize that it comes at the cost of like enemy complexity right so for example in a lot of older final fantasies Hitting enemies physically does not do anything. You need to cast. And I think that they're just trying to, you know, find a middle ground between hitting enemies, uh, between, I'm sorry, not hitting enemies, between having enemies that are as difficult and as complex as Final Fantasy XII and being as newcomer friendly as Final Fantasy XV. If you remember, when they talked about Final Fantasy XV ages ago, they specifically said, it was a Final Fantasy for first timers and veterans alike, and or was it veterans or fans? One of the one of them. You, know, you get my point. And so because of that, you know, now we've seen two Final Fantasy games where it's pretty simplistic. Now, granted, sixteen does up the difficulty towards the later sections. You know, your dodges do have to be pretty tight. Uh, now it is forgiving. It's not. It's like it's it's like Bayonetta forgiving with a little bit more forgiveness. So you know, it's not like it's a complete walk in the park. Um, definitely, I think the final boss is challenging. I think that it feels good when you do some of these fights and you dodge out of attacks. Whenever you dodge, um, you gain iframes for a set amount. This is standard fare for almost every video game that has a dodge button. But also, if your timing is really on point to the attack, you enter what's called a precision dodge, basically. So you could have a dodge, I found this out multiple times. You could dodge an attack and not gain a precision dodge, which slows time down and lets you counter attack. But you could dodge an attack and still get iframes. And I've had that happen to me multiple times throughout the game, is that I would dodge an attack. And it's it's not like a problem. It doesn't really change anything. I'm just, it's one of those things I note that the iframes are separate, which is kind of cool. So if you miss the precision dodge window, there's still the chance for you to get the iframe window, which is cool. Uh, additionally, you can also parry attacks. But parrying attacks requires you to hit an enemy, probably on an almost frame level, uh, you know, a very narrow frame window every attack probably can be parried i don't know i don't know if every attack can but it seems pretty much like bosses and normal enemies alike can be parried you're probably going to trigger it more often than not completely accidentally unless you really understand the pattern of, of each enemy and where exactly you need to hit them for it um it's a cool system to have it can save you a little bit save some time let you get in some extra damage etc so the general flow of combat for most enemies is that most enemies will either have what's called a willpower bar which is effectively what leads into the stagger that we've had since final fantasy 13 or they won't if they don't you just hit them normally and then they die usually those enemies are pretty easy uh with the exception of one or two hunts where the enemies didn't have it um usually enemies without willpower bars are pretty easy to toss around they're like a step up from dynasty warriors grunts and whatever 
if an enemy has a willpower bar, they're either like a mini boss or a boss. Pretty much the gameplay of it is similar to 13, where the goal is to fill the, remember how the goal in 13 was to fill the stagger bar so you could deal big damage when you staggered the enemy? Well, in this game, the bar is full and it's your job to deplete it. Now, one of the things that happens is that as you attack an enemy, you deal damage and stagger damage based on your weapon, your level, etc. So the, obviously the higher your level in relative to your enemy, the faster the, the stagger bar depletes. If you just do a basic amount of quests, you'll pretty much be ahead of the story. You'll be pretty much ahead of a lot of things by the end of the game. So don't worry about that. Um, once the stagger bar depletes down to 50%, enemies will temporarily, very shortly be broken. Uh, the reason this exists, I guess, is to give you a minor reprieve. You can also use Garuda to pull pretty much any enemy off balance while they're at 50%. It doesn't do a lot of damage. It's not game changing, but it will give you a couple, you know, an opportunity perhaps to get in some extra hits um and then lastly when the stagger bar is broken the game plays a little animation the enemy usually falls to their knees or something or fall you know if they're they don't have knees they collapse on the ground or something like that and at this point every one of your attacks will begin to do more damage they'll be it'll be multiplied by 1.05 times up to 1.5 times extra damage based on um how much based on how much you know how many times you hit it so for example if you this is where you want to hit an enemy a whole bunch you want to use your abilities to get in a lot of deathly blows and a lot of deadly attacks and stuff and once you do that then you will be able to do a lot more damage to them it, it, it's your standard fare right that's the moment when you unload you go ham you hit as hard as you can for a couple of seconds etc etc right if you played 13 this is very similar to 13 and this might be one of the few really good aspects of 13 in my opinion was the combat system not so much the leveling and definitely not so much the open world um and basically most boss fights boil down to a rinse repeat of break an enemy you know hit him with big damage and, and while he's down and and so on and so forth now the last thing i I think I've covered most things about the combat. The last thing to cover is the limit break system. What will happen is that as you fight, after a certain point in the story, you'll be able to enter limit break. Now, like most Final Fantasy games, you already know, limit breaks, desperation attacks, that's your moment to do big damage. Well, not so much desperation attacks, uh, which you could get through all of six without seeing, which is so funny to me. Um, but yeah. Final Fantasy always has limit breaks since like seven. Pretty much it allows you to deal big damage. Now in this game, it's not like the quickenings of Final Fantasy 12 or anything like that. It's pretty much Devil Trigger. Again, going back to this game's Devil May Cry uh, inspiration. So if you enter limit break, pretty much it gives you resistances. You won't be knocked away as easily. You slowly heal a little bit and all your attacks are augmented and you deal more damage. So obviously when you stagger an enemy the basic flow will be to stagger an enemy by breaking their willpower <clears throat> limit breaking and then hitting them with your heaviest attacks now the limit break gauge will continue to take down while you're hitting an enemy or like let's say you use a move like judgment bolt judgment bolt will pretty much freeze time it stops the time uh from the stops the stagger bar from depleting it basically stops the game for a second while you deal all that damage however your limit break will still tick down but that's okay because you could deal big damage and that's pretty much the gameplay loop of the game for combat now let's talk about everything else uh this is one of the most generic open worlds i think i've played in a while it's not very great uh it's not really an open world in fairness to them but it's like different sectioned off areas kind of similarly to final fantasy 12. Now they're big there's a lot to run around and do well, well i don't know about do but there's a lot to run around you can encounter hunts out here if you know what hunts are it's basically like you find monsters or, or mobs that are you know terrorizing people or whatever and you could go kill them there's a board in your your hideout that lets you find uh, you know figure out where they are and they get ranked from d to s it's a very good way to make money um so yeah you you can you run around the open world there's not really a lot to do you pretty much just go from a to b there's never like wandering you know and I, again they they said that this was not going to be the case with the game right they said we're not having an open world uh they were very upfront about it so that's that's fine but i do think that having stuff to do in the open world would be better right i feel like a lot of times the game is very very heavy on the linearity and and like let, let's put it like this right final fantasy 15's first act 
when you're wandering around the outskirts of, of Insomnia, pretty much is the closest Final Fantasy has gotten to open world gameplay in a single player game. And I think that that's like one of the saddest things about it is that they had a really good idea for Versus 13 and in an alternate timeline, it would have led to this game possibly being better. But as it stands, this game is pretty straightforward. Now that said, there are in intentionally linear sections of the game, usually big story beats, like when you invade to kill a mother crystal or something. Like that's usually when you, you know, that sort of happens. But at the same time, it's not a biggie. Um, I don't mind that certain portions are linear, right? But what I will say is that it removes the dungeon crawling aspect, right? Like Final Fantasy dungeons a lot of times could be pretty confusing. You know, they're kind of mazes. Yeah, they were linear. I kind of wish they weren't. I say this about like every game now though, like even Zelda games, like why are dungeons linear and straightforward and, and don't really have a lot? And I wish that they weren't. I, I really wish that they were more straightforward and or, they're not straightforward. So I wish they were more complex. I wish they weren't so straightforward. You could go around and find all these different crazy weird things and stuff. And sadly, that that's not the case here, which is unfortunate. Um, again, I think that the biggest problem with Final Fantasy 16 is that it's really scared to let go of your hand. So the first like almost 10 hours of the game is like a flat linear storyline. Now I know when you have a game, you have to have a linear intro so you can introduce people to the fucking story, right? I get that. That's That makes perfect sense to me. I'm not like confused by that. I get it. You want to make sure you open up the game and it has some amount of linearity or, you know, some basis, some backbone to let, you know, the player get immersed in the world to figure out what's going on. Pretty much the entire intro of the game is like a two hour, like I said, flashback to when Clive was like 15 years old, right? And, and it would be cool, you know, again, maybe if this game like lets you toggle between the different time periods and, you know, there's more missions and things between that, or at least, you know, so what game did this where you had like a past segment and a, a future segment, not Ocarina, there was another game that did this, but, you know, having more stuff to do, maybe you're unlocking memories and stuff because this game is very story rich. They reference a lot of events. And it would be cool maybe to like have moments where, where you're talking about it and you know you actually get to see it and go to these places. But a lot of that revolves around having a nice big open world filled with different things to do, which Final Fantasy 16 generally seems to lack. Now, it's okay if you wanna have a linear game. I just don't think that Final Fantasy games are really that great linear. I think the best one, again, I gotta give credit to is Stranger of Paradise because I think Stranger of Paradise does a lot of what this game does and a lot of it better even and um okay sorry about that um so to wrap it all up like i said the overworld in final fantasy 16 in my opinion just needs a little bit more to do it needs more build up right there's a lot of quests right there's a lot of back and forth but it feels very much like there's not a lot of exploration maybe it's just the lack of like dungeon you know plundering i guess there's there's not really any dungeons to explore that aren't part of the main story so you know like how you, when you play like a fallout game you know like there's areas that are obviously like major hubs you know you interact with the world everything's like one solid piece you know except barring dlc and you go back and forth around the overworld and stuff like that um and you know like how every time there's a different path or something like that you know there's ways around water and things um I just wish that we could get a Final Fantasy game that has this, because I think the biggest problem with this game is at no point does it ever really let up on its linearity. At no point, like I said, the game feels reluctant to like let go of your hand. And I mean, even then, then you find out that there really isn't much to explore. So the game just kind of ends up being pretty much linear regardless, which I think is just unfortunate. You know, when you have 12 where you're supposed to run all over the place, it's also kind of, you know, straightforward, the different ways you can go in 12. Like, I, I like worlds that interlap and, you know, loop together, unfortunately, which is not what we got here. So what we end up having is a game that has very, very good, you know, combat and an overworld that is very lackluster. And I feel like that's one of the biggest defining points of it. Now, like I said, I said I was going to circle back around to the story. As I said, without getting too in-depth into it, um, you know, this game, well, specifically about the story is the setting, the narrative, things like that. So this game is meant to be a very darker Final Fantasy, right? 
So this game draws a lot of inspiration from like Game of Thrones and stuff like that. They're very open about this, not a mystery. So there's a lot of cursing. There's a lot of, um, you know, I don't want to say political intrigue, right? Because then I think people immediately jump to like Phantom Menace levels, which weren't that bad anyway, but I digress. Um, but, you know, they definitely spend a lot of time setting up the world. There's a lot of cutscenes establishing who these characters are. And I think that it comes together nicely with some pretty epic boss fights. But then it kind of ends up becoming... Like, the, the one game I remember being kind of similar to this, although not totally, is like Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm 2. Because there is an overworld in that game. But pretty much when you're playing the story of that game... Again, it's Naruto, so take it for what it is, right? You just go from fight to fight to fight. And while this game obviously has way more to offer than that, which is at this point, what, like a 2010 game? Um, at the same time, I do kind of feel like if there was some more stuff to do, like building up resources, more intricate crafting systems that require more loot, you know, things like that, then maybe it would work out. But like what we end up here is like the opposite of Tales of Arise. So in Tales of Arise, you don't get enough loot to make you know, to sell, to make money, to buy items that you need for combat. In 16, by the end of the game, I was swimming in gill, never spent almost even half of it. Most of the gill that you're supposed to get is to be spent on, like, orchestrion rolls, which are, like, you know, music soundtracks you could buy for the orchestrion in your hideout. Or, you know, like, charms that you could use to make cooldowns shorter and things like that. And I was swimming in money because I didn't partake of any of those because, you know, that's like a completionist thing and i wasn't really going for a completionist run because you have to grind money and i didn't want to grind money um so yeah between that and like so you have tons of crafting materials to the point that at the end of the game you only need certain like exotic and legendary crafting items and then you can mash them together make your own craftable um you know make your own gear right like that's the point is like the best weapons in the game come from you crafting and using the blacksmith right so because of that you know there's not really other things to craft you know like items you could just buy for dirt cheap again this game walks on the line the side of the line that's easy for the player ease nothing too hectic no random game overs lenient checkpoints that sort of a thing and it just feels like final fantasy never really could leave the shadow of 13 and 15. Now granted this is obviously better than 13 and 15 but it's a weird moment because Lightning Returns had a better open world and a better way that the quests and everything mixed together with the actual gameplay. So for example in Lightning Returns not to spoil anything or whatever for a decade old game almost but I, I respect that. Um, in Lightning Returns you play obviously as lightning the side quests you do contribute time back so you can get more time to get to the end of the game and that's part of the whole like gameplay of the game is that you contribute time by doing completing people's requests you get more strength you get more magic damage and then you get and eventually once you do enough side quests you pull together all the the hope and the faith that people have and it gives you an extra day to do stuff before the end of the game and so like there is in that way it's worth seeking out side quests and planning how much you can do in one day right and that's that's hilariously enough no one ever gives this game any credit because the games that precluded it or, or preceded it sorry were way 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 worse but i love that about lightning returns is that yeah the areas were separated or whatever but you had these big open worlds to traverse yeah there's that clock in the background that's slowly ticking down to zero but at the same time it was fun i i, I had a great time on that game i beat it on my first run i had a great time and the game has a perfect new game plus to start right over from the beginning had a pretty fulfilling ending and it's a shame that like 15 and 16 never really got up to like that world design 15 had it to a degree and then like i said the latter half of 15 is like a linear six hour story conclusion that they i felt like they just stapled on so they could say the game has a full story the meanwhile and then fix it with dlcs most of which didn't happen or a good chunk of which didn't happen 16 has the problem of having a good story good characters good narrative great combat minus a few tweaks with like the control scheme or whatever i think would be better um and then the game itself ends up being like this box like the world is just very boxy you know there's not really much of a reason to explore the items you pick up in the overworld don't really contribute to much um 
after a point, like I said, I had everything I needed. The side quests are worth doing, but most of them boil down to just let talk to dude for five minutes go here come back and i mean again i don't expect every side quest to reinvent the wheel but that's why when you have things like final of like uh, fallout and other things like that you know having those side quests be a little bit different and varied helps with the with the diversity of the game like so you can for example complete a side quest before you even pick up the item and then you just turn in the item and like i get that that requires a certain amount of game design and i guess the world has to be big so you don't just stumble upon it just by walking into every like little quadrant of the map you know like finding a random item in a fallout playthrough much harder than finding something in you know like a designated map where there's boundaries you know what i mean so ultimately i think that the worst part of final fantasy 16 definitely has to go to the world map and, and just the way you interact with it there's not really much to do you get fast travel which is fine uh, again when, once the game really opens up in quotations like you really can see how not little they put into it but how restrained it is it's, it's not a matter of laziness because what's there is refined it's just i feel that if they added more to it it would have been more meaningful it would have been better um besides that uh the only thing i'll say is that graphically this game looks good as of right now it's only out on playstation 5 um sony has signed an exclusivity deal with them or a timed exclusivity deal uh with with uh square enix so six months from i think what was it mid late june so like at the end of this year maybe early next year the pc version will drop and then at other points i'm assuming the xbox version will drop as well so just for right now, it's only available on PS uh, on PS4. I'm sorry, PS5. Exclude, exclu exclude me. Yeah, excuse me. PS5. Um, looks fine. Plays good. Didn't really have too many frame drops that I could think of. Pretty solid even during the fighting. Uh, when there's a bunch of effects going on and all that, things were been things were good. Didn't really mind that. The characters look great. You know the 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 animations look fluid. Things look crisp. Love it. No, nothing really to say bad to say about graphics i mean that's the problem with graphics is like outside of like ghost of tsushima which was probably the last game i really praised heavily for its graphics especially on the base ps4 i mean it looks good it, it's what i would expect it's definitely a cut above right but i I'm, i don't know maybe i'm just not the person to ask about graphics i mean the frame rate is most is pretty much solid almost ever all the time from what i remember and that that's what really matters especially in an action game so that's probably the most that I could really say about it. Um, beyond that, I think one of the things I, I liked a lot is the music. The music of this game is good. It's not Final Fantasy XIV good. If, if For those of you who don't know, this is the same development team that makes Final Fantasy XIV. I'm a longtime player of it. And, you know, Soken is a genius. Soken has been making bangers for 14 since its remake. Maybe I don't know. I don't know if he worked on 1.0, but he's been making bangers for as long as I can remember. And you know, sometimes this game kind of gets to that level. Um, but for the most part, there's one fight about halfway through the game, and I kind of sarcastically called it like this is the the peak. And it kind of was, like, both musically and just fight-wise. Now, the final fight was also pretty good, so I guess I should have corrected that. Didn't really harp, uh, you know, ponder that too much since I was done after that. But, um, yeah, I think that this game has a lot of good stuff going for it. You know, the music could have been maybe a little more dialed. I, it's because I played Soken's other game where he goes nuts with the music. I think that... I don't know. It feels like they wanted to be restrained. You know what I mean? Like they're being formal. You know, they didn't want to have too much crazy stuff in it. And I feel like that's what really makes Final Fantasy Final Fantasy, right? Not again. I, I hate to say that because then people will say, well, this is not a Final Fantasy game. I hate that argument. That is so lame, bro. I hate that. People, people say that about every new Final Fantasy. But what really makes a Final Fantasy game cool is when you have crazy stupid shit in it you know what i mean and like yeah this game has big explosions people transforming into icons things like that there's there's a, a lot of that but man the music is what fi people love about final fantasy that's one of the biggest parts tell me you you could not even play final fantasy 7 you know when sephiroth's theme is man hell you could be some random joe blow who bought kingdom hearts for the playstation back in 2004 2005 whichever kingdom hearts back then and you know who sephiroth is if you played the game long enough you know what i mean like without even playing his game you know that this dude everything about him his music his theme <laughs> his everything 
You know what I mean? And, and that's what's interesting. Kefka has it in spades, uh, you know, a lot of the classic games. And I think that the, if they had channeled a little bit more of that, like, energy, that chaotic energy, it would have been a little bit stronger, in my opinion. Um, oh, sorry. But it's a good job for what it is. Uh, the boss fights are good. The music is epic. It's It's epic, but it's not, like... 14 levels of cracked if you've heard 14 soundtrack it, sometimes they they just put on everything bro it's it's crazy that's why i love that game so much um but what would i give final fantasy 16 now originally i said it was like an 8 to like an 8 uh an 8.5 somewhere in that range uh i mean like i said i think the biggest problem is the world design um not that the world looks bad but just that there's not a lot to do and in a game in 2023 like yeah, the combat is really good and fun, but if there's no reason to go out and do combat because your levels don't really add much, then I don't want to do the combat. You know what I mean? It's like when you play, like, say, again, I keep bringing up Fallout 4 because I just played it on stream. When you keep, when you, when you have a game like Fallout, right, or Mass Effect, doing that, co at least Mass Effect 1, the Mass Effect 2 also suffers from this a little bit. Every fight feels meaningful because every fight gets you noticeably closer to your next level. So, I, and you know, I, the last three levels of Mass Effect 1, at least the original version, were a little bit out there. But that's that's besides the point. When you're generally doing a new playthrough, I don't even think you can get to 60 on a single playthrough of Mass Effect 1. But when you're doing one of these games, right, when you're killing enemies in Final Fantasy 12, you know, you're watching your LP tick up. You're watching your experience go up. So when you get that level up, you feel that meaningful boost in stats. I never really felt like a meaningful boost in stats in this game. Doing side quests got me high enough level, right? And maybe that's something. But for the most part, I never really felt like levels mattered that much in this game. And again, I hate that because I love when levels matter because I feel like you know that's the nice progression I like about a lot of games. And now games are removing that. I, I wish that there was more that you could get out of it. But I think because this game is very straightforward with its controls, and there's a lot of complexity, like I said, the parrying and the dodging and the stuff, I think that's fine, but if you had more like 12 where you learn different techniques, gambits, maybe there's like different wheels that you should be able to equip, you know, so like you have a magic wheel and a technique wheel, things like that, you know, and again, I see a lot of people talking about Stranger of Paradise more favorably now, I mean, but to be fair, in fairness to 16, 16 is meant to be like more complex than 15 but not like 12 levels of complex i could understand them not wanting to make 12 again 12 was very complex especially with the hunts the hunts in 16 are very easy you could do them all on your final on your first playthrough especially by the end of the game but stranger paradise was made to be a dark souls clone you know that it's a souls clone it's a neo it's derivative from neo it's literally made by the people that made neo so i understand why stranger paradise can get away with it because it's inherently made for a more niche but hardcore audience which is ironic because i think stranger of paradise is an amazing game i think many people should try it yeah the story is whatever i think the story is actually pretty good as a as a prologue but i think it's a really good game and i won't say that 16 is bad by any measure in the same way i won't say that stranger of paradise is bad by any measure i think stranger of paradise is a fantastic game but the thing about it is Stranger of Paradise, I gave something like a 9, a 90. So, like, I don't think that 16 passes it in anything besides story. I think gameplay-wise, yeah, it's made to be more simplistic. But I feel like, other than maybe the dodge being a little bit more reactive and easier to trigger, which, you know, like I said, easier. Um, I think Stranger of Paradise just had it more in spades. So, what would I give 16? I already said this already, and I went on another tangent. I'm going to give Final Fantasy 16 a little bit better of a score than I originally said. The reason why is because now that I've beaten it, I thought about it for a little bit. As a package, you're going to enjoy it, right? If you could look beyond the fact that it's cripplingly linear, I, I think you're going to have a good time. And there's moments where you could, you know, run around, do whatever, fine. Some of the hunts require you to find them totally. But, like... At the same time, I do like the game enough. I think that the combat is fun. They have New Game Plus, so if you really want to relive some of those fights, I think that would be kind of cool, right? You could go back and replay some of the stuff. Uh, and if you just want an experience where you feel like you're not missing out on like 90% of the content, you know, like 12 where you beat it, it's like, great, well, now there's a billion other things to do that you're not high enough level to do. I get that, right? Meanwhile, with Final Fantasy 16, I did basically everything but the super challenge mode. Oh, there's a, a bunch of stone tablets around the world map that 
have are like challenges right like you're supposed to you you know defeat them i don't know what you get for doing it but you know you're supposed to use one icon and clear a certain amount of trials on under a time limit i got close with one of them i said hey, i'm not doing that that's like you know that's whatever so that's like you're one of the biggest things i think that you could do that's that's like the ultimate end game other than that um i think i would give final fantasy uh strange stranger of paradise oh final fantasy 16 and 87 out of 100 i think it does a lot i have to take off a large chunk for that overworld though like if you could look beyond that you're gonna have a good time i think the story is interesting from start to finish it's got a lot of good characters it's got a lot of high points a lot of good moments um the side quests really flesh out the world even as you know straightforward and and typical as they are uh and like the last thing i would say probably is that it, it looks good it plays good it's just that that a to b like back and forth could have been a little better so in any event that's all i got for you today i will see you guys next time